Hey there. I am um, always a little bit embarrassed to attempt to present the history of any single country to you in a 20 minute or so lecture, but I'm particularly embarrassed to do it for China because there is just so very much history there. Um, and I spend a bunch of time on China in my other course, AP World History, all of which is a long way of saying that there's a bunch of stuff I'm going to leave out of this. Please don't go away from this video thinking that you have learned the history of China in its entirety. Uh, that's quite unlikely to happen in the space of a single YouTube video, no matter what YouTube tries to tell you. You, but I am going to, as always, highlight some points that are going to be important for understanding China's present political system and some major social and political issues. So um, before we get into the chronology, I just want to say a word about Chinese names because this is um, a mistake that people make every single year uh, if they have no um, background in how this works. So the person that you are looking at with the absolutely fantastic silhouette and hairline is Bao Zedong. I'll talk about him in a little bit. Um, he is the leader of the Chinese Communist Party um, for basically half of the 20th century. Um, and his name is, uh, as are Chinese names generally, written last name, then first name. So when in general, there's a couple of exceptions, but in general, um, in Chinese, as is true, by the way, in much of East Asia, um, the last name or the family name, the name inherited from, and for most Chinese people, your father comes first, and then the given name, what Americans would call the first name, comes last. So Mao is Mao Zedong's last name in the Western sense. Uh, it's his family name, and Zedong is his given name. It's the one that he was assigned at birth. Um, so just worth noting, one other thing too, um, is that uh, because Chinese language is written in characters and not in any kind of alphabet, there's a couple different ways of Roman, of transliterating that, uh, that uh, those characters into the Roman alphabet. Um, the newer one, the more recent one, which has become quite standardized in recent decades, is called Pinyin, and that's the first transliteration you see on your screen. There's another system called Wade Giles, which is older, but which you'll sometimes see uh, for historical figures in China, um, whose names became widely known in the West before the Pinyin transliteration system came around. So just so you know, those three names you see on your screen are all the same person. I am telling you this because every single year I get a considerable number of CompGov students um, who write papers or who give me briefings or do short answers about Jinping, the president of China, uh, which doesn't really compute unless you are like his close personal friend. Um, so generally speaking, if you see a Chinese name, uh, the monosyllabic thing, uh, the monosyllabic word that comes first is actually the last name or the family name. And that's what you should use if you are abbreviating somebody's full name. Happy to help you with this, of course, just ask. All right, um, here is much of Chinese history in literally a single slide. It's embarrassing as a history teacher, but we do what we gotta do. Um, China, the, the concept of the nation of China uh, first comes about in the year 221 BCE. So if you're doing your math, that's more than uh, 2,200 years ago um, under a dynasty known as the Qin. Um, they don't last super long, but they do unify a bunch of territory that remains, there remains an idea of China from the Qin dynasty into present times. A couple of political features, China's gonna be um, ruled by a series of um, different dynasties under a monarchical system for the next 2000 years. I have a song about it that I make my AP World students sing. A couple of important features of that political history. Number one, one of the ideas that's used to legitimate political authority throughout dynastic Chinese history is this concept called the Mandate of Heaven, which suggests that the emperor is not literally divine, but that he has been given a mandate or a responsibility, an endorsement from heaven. Um, traditional Chinese religion is not real big on the concept of a single personified God, um, but heaven is this kind of cosmological force which is understood to endorse the power wielded by the emperor. On the other hand, what heaven giveth, heaven can taketh, heaven taketh away. Um, and so when things start to go badly for much of Chinese history, people start looking at each other and say, hey, maybe this flood or this famine or this peasant rebellion means that the emperor has lost the mandate of heaven. So this is a traditional concept which can both legitimate authority and undermine an existing authority and pre present an argument for that authority's replacement. Thing number two is that China does a really, really, really almost world-leading job. Persia is the other ancient empire that does a really good job of this, of establishing an extensive and very well-organized bureaucracy. Um, 
unlike some other decent, more decentralized empires in classical and early modern history, where um, the administrative and tax collection responsibilities of the state are farmed out to local notables, um, China has this network of people throughout the country who are working for um, the emperor, who are in the direct employ of the emperor and who are supposed to serve the state and not any particular individual. Um, the way, by the way, to get one of those fancy bureaucratic jobs, because they're really relatively high status in Chinese um, society is to be able to pass an increasingly complex and difficult examination testing Confucian texts. There's a number of different religious and philosophical traditions, uh, some of which are in China, they're influential in Chinese history, some of which are native to China, some of which notably Buddhism are imports. Um, but the, I think, most politically influential one is called Confucianism, which is really not a religion. It doesn't have a particular god so much as it is a system of beliefs about how to keep the world functioning in an orderly fashion. So Confucianism emphasizes hierarchical relationships. It emphasizes the necessity to fulfill your personal role given whatever your station is in life. And so there's a really strong emphasis on obedience, on performing what is expected of you given your station in life, uh, on knowing who is above you and who is below you uh, in the sort of rankings of society. And that, as I said, is going to form the basis for these civil service examinations. So by the time this modern post-imperial China comes around, we've had almost this 2000 year history with, of course, lots of changes and pivots along the way um, of a strong centralized state um, of this philosophic, this set of philosophical ideas that have been built up to legitimate the emperor's authority um, and of this philosophical uh, influence of Confucianism, which is really not about individualism. It's not about your personal rights. It's not about your freedom of expression. It's about knowing your role and performing it uh, in a way that is going to keep society functioning in an orderly fashion. Um, fast forward to the 20th century. Um, this is, you know, where I skip a bunch of stuff in between. Um, in 1911, the Qing Dynasty, which is the last uh, monarchical family to rule China, falls apart. There's a cute baby emperor. His name is Puyi, P-U-Y-I. You should Google him. He's adorable. He's like three when he ascends the throne. Um, that obviously doesn't last. Um, there are reasons, of course, much more important than the baby emperor, but uh, that's the one that I like to emphasize. Um, but long story short, China has failed to keep, uh, keep up with the industrializing, modernizing uh, countries of the world, and under internal and external pressure, the dynasty falls apart. Um, China is then declared a republic, but, oh, there's Pui, the baby emperor. Isn't he cute? I want that hat. Um, so two parties emerge with very, very different visions about how post-monarchical China should be operated. The first one is called the Kuomintang, um, which is sometimes abbreviated KMT, that's the old transliteration, uh, and which roughly translates to nationalist party. Their leader is a guy named Chiang Kai-shek. The other is the much smaller, raggedy group uh, of idealists known as the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and the guy who will eventually emerge as their most important leader is Mao Zedong. Um, for much of the period between 1927 and 1949, with a couple of pauses, those two groups will be at war with one another uh, for the right to determine who will control China in the future. And in 1949, the communists win. They enter Beijing, the capital, um, and they declare the formation of this new communist state called the People's Republic of China. And that's the birth of the state that we study in the AP CompGo, of course. Um, the many supporters, Chiang Kai-shek and his followers in the Kuomintang, uh, flee to Taiwan, um, which is an island off the eastern coast of China. Hold that in the back of your head, uh, because that's going to help us start to understand one of the most important geopolitical issues that China has in its foreign relations up to the present day. Under Mao, and this is one of those guys who's just so important that we need to talk about him by name for quite a while. Um, under Mao, a couple of important developments in Chinese history. Number one, so Mao serves as the leader of the Chinese Communist Party from the inception of the PRC, from the date that this new country is founded, until 1976, and he leaves office by dying. So he really is going to have to uh, work pretty hard to maintain control over the party and the country um, over the course of his lifetime. A couple major policies to highlight. Um, the first is the Great Leap Forward, which turns out, I think, in the estimation of most contemporary scholars, to be one of the most massive human catastrophes in all of history. Um, 
in the during the Great Leap Forward, uh, Mao and his administration decide um, that what they need to do is collectivize agriculture. Many, the vast majority of Chinese people in 1958 are peasant farmers working fairly small plots of land. Um, and the goal of the Great Leap Forward is to do two things. It's to collectivize agriculture, so to make bigger farms in which people work together and potentially produce more surplus. And second, to industrialize and modernize China's economy, um, to get China away from an agriculture culturally dependent economy and towards producing more manufacturers. And the really weird, unique thing about the Great Leap Forward is that Mao's plan involves somehow industrialization without urbanization, which to my knowledge has never really happened in human history. Um, the result is that there is some degree of industrialization, but there is also more importantly, just massive, massive famine throughout the country. Um, that's due to a combination of sort of bad luck, bad weather, and very, very poor management, it turns out, um, of China's new agricultural production methods. Um, and so after 1960, the, you know, the Great Leap Forward is actually put to a halt before it was intended to end um, because there is this really serious concern uh, about Mao's ability to lead the country without starving millions of people to death. Um, in the, over the course of the 1960s, I also want to mention, because we're just coming off of a case study of Russia, um, that despite the fact that these are the world's first two major communist countries, China in the 1960s is actually gradually going to break away from the Soviet Union. Um, the two countries will actually be uh, almost at the brink of war with each other at one point. Um, but it's just worth noting that the, uh, the Soviet Union and China after the 60s or so are pursuing quite different ends in foreign policy and quite different approaches to communism. Uh, in particular, the Chinese communist ideology emphasizes the role of peasant farmers as the revolutionary class, whereas Soviet ideology emphasizes urban industrial workers as the revolutionary class. Um, but there are also just, there, there are pettier competitions over lands uh, between the two nations' borders, and there are pettier competitions over who gets to be the global face of communism. And the net result is that China and the Soviet Union are not necessarily supporting each other in their domestic or foreign policy aims after this gradual event of the Sino-Soviet split. Um, by 1960, by the mid-1960s, um, Mao's power within the Communist Party is actually waning. Um, the catastrophic effects of the Great Leap Forward have convinced some other Chinese communist leaders that Mao might not be the best suited person to lead the party into the future. Um, and so Mao tries to do an end around the party establishments in this event called the Cultural Revolution in 1966, which will end up, it's most intense in 1966-67, uh, but in some form or another, the Cultural Revolution will last through the end of Mao's life. So it, it ends up lasting for uh, a full decade. Um, what Mao encourages ordinary Chinese people and particularly high school and college students to do in, at the outset of the Cultural Revolution um, is to try and seize power back from the Communist Party. So from this institution of which Mao is, you know, uh, in which Mao is an incredibly influential figure. Um, and so he really encourages this massive popular mobilization, particularly among young people. He encourages them to criticize the state. He encourages them to criticize the party. He demands that the party move uh, in, in a direction of more radical change. Um, and he succeeds in creating this cult of personality surrounding himself. And so this is where Mao really consolidates his power and establishes um, that there really isn't going to be a communist China with without Mao Zedong. When Mao dies in 1976, and I'll, I'll pause for some foreign policy stuff before we get there, but um, when Mao dies in 1976, that's going to open up a really big question about what leadership of the Chinese Communist Party is going to look like after him. Um, one other thing to note about the or development of communist China um, before we move on to after Mao um, is that there are a couple of regions that are just worth thinking about um, that uh, in which the PRC, the Communist Party, is going to um, consolidate its political authority. Uh, these are areas that are the first two of these areas have been conquered uh, initially during the Qing dynasty of China. So they've been technically part of China for a couple hundred years uh, by the time that the PRC is declared. Uh, but the communists will try and tighten their control in these regions. One of those regions is Xinjiang, uh, sometimes referred to as East Turkestan, most, mostly by nationalists in Xinjiang. Um, this is in Northwestern China. It's a predominantly Muslim region. Uh, the biggest minority ethnic group there is a people 
people called the Uyghurs, who are mostly ethnic, uh, who mostly who are not different from uh, who are mostly Muslim and who are different from the Han Chinese ethnic majority. Um, and so the PRC is going to try and consolidate its control and its power in Xinjiang under Mao. Um, similarly, in Tibet, in Western China, uh, which is dominated by ethnic Tibetans, and where there's a particular strand of Tibetan Buddhism that has historically been very, very influential, um, the party's also going to consolidate and extend its influence in Tibet, which is known in Mandarin uh, as Xizang. That's the official PRC name for it, although not really common outside of China. Um, finally, um, the PRC will insist in this period on claiming sovereignty over Taiwan, which is this island to which uh, the defeated Kuomintang has fled after the end of the Civil War in 1949. That's going to be a mainstay of Chinese foreign policy and of Chinese nationalist rhetoric, so keep your eye out for it in the news surrounding China. So Mao dies in 1976. There's going to be a um, power struggle, uh, a little bit of jockeying for control after his death. But by 1978, um, a guy named Deng Xiaoping has emerged as Mao's successor. Deng is an interesting figure because there's this, as I said, open question about how China is going to move into the future. And Deng's solution is to encourage economic reform, to encourage some degree of opening up to the rest of the world, both economically and politically, but to very firmly say no to any kind of political liberalization. Um, he introduces a new system called the household responsibility system. So China's rural farmers have been uh, organized into these communes um, and have been essentially uh, producing for the state since the Great Leap Forward. And under the household responsibility system, Deng shifts that to a system where in the countryside, farmers can sell what they make after they've paid their taxes. And so you see an introduction of just tiny bits of capitalism in that uh, in that policy. Um, he also establishes a couple of different cities as special economic zones, um, which are designed to promote foreign investment. So he relaxes the rules on trade, he relaxes the rules on foreign investment in these specific cities, and that is going to attract a lot of outside companies who are wanting to do business with the very large Chinese market. Um, there's These economic reforms are going to open up a lot of hope in the rest of the world, particularly in the United States and in Europe, um, that Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms mean he's also going to be open to political reforms. Um, but those hopes are dashed in 1989 when uh, large pro-democracy protests in Beijing uh, at the critical location of Tiananmen Square um, are brutally suppressed by the military. And that's the signal to the outside world that Deng Xiaoping is not going to consider loosening the Communist Party's control over Chinese politics, even though he's willing to consider dialing back the amount of communism uh, in the Communist Party. Um, two very brief quantitative uh, in indicators of the effects of Deng's policies. The first is that GDP per capita, the kind of measure, the, the most blunt force measure that we have um, of the size and the product, the production of an economy, um, is going to rise very steadily uh, once Deng Xiaoping comes to power. And so China is very clearly going to get wealthier. Um, the other is that the Gini index, which measures income inequality, is also going to go up. And so China, after Deng, is also going to become somewhat more unequal. Um, after Deng leaves power in 1989, um, what we see, his three successors to date, um, have been considered technocrats, although Xi Jinping, the current president, um, might fall into a slightly different category. Um, but Deng, Deng Xiaoping's successors are considered to kind of have something in common with him in the sense that they are competent bureaucrats, they are solid administrators, but they're less interested in fire-breathing communist ideological rhetoric, and they're more interested in pragmatic pursuit of stability and of economic growth. Um, in order, they are Jiang Zemin, um, uh, who uh, runs the show from 1993 to 2003, um, Hu Jintao, who runs it from 2003 to 2013, um, and then Xi Jinping, uh, who takes office in 2013 and is, as of this recording, uh, still the president of China and, more importantly, the general secretary of the Communist Party. A um, couple of themes in their leadership. Um, number one, China's economic growth has continued. It uh, continues to um, be just an incredibly important economic power uh, that experiences really, really speedy rates of economic growth. Um, the second is that there have been smooth transition 
smooth transitions of power. There has not really been the kind of chaos, particularly within the Communist Party leadership, that characterized some of the years under Mao Zedong. And finally, there's been a growing assertion of nationalism by China's leadership, uh, a growing move by China um, to position itself on the world stage as a major power player. Um, and more recently, the conversation has kind of been that China is emerging as the other major superpower in the world other than the United States, particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union. Lots more to say, uh, but I'll leave it there. I will see you soon. Thanks.